Very nice I'm to Harrison. meet you. I'm Lillian. Hi, Lillian. Thank you so much. It's so nice to meet you. All right. This is Harrison Tyler, the grandson of our 10th president, John Tyler. Well, he's William and Harrison is kin to me, too. <laughs> Harrison Tyler is also the great-grandson on his mother's side of our ninth president, William Henry Harrison. Harrison Tyler is 88 years old, and I went to visit him near Richmond, Virginia. Unfortunately, he suffered a horrible stroke two years ago that erased his memory, so he couldn't share recollections of his family history. But he has been reminded since, both by those he knows and those he doesn't know, that he has a special connection to American presidential history. He let me sit with him as he signed letter after letter from people who've written asking for his signature. And he told me about how just days before he went to visit the grave of his grandfather. He couldn't remember all the times he had visited in the past, so he wanted to go back to build a new memory and to understand how his own story is intertwined with the story of U.S. history. I'm Lillian Cunningham with The Washington Post, and this is the 10th episode of Presidential. We shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. What your country can do for you. A date which will live in infamy. John Tyler is the vice president who became president himself when William Henry Harrison died in office after only 32 days. Tyler served as president basically the entire term that Harrison was supposed to have served, from 1841 until 1845. Tyler and Harrison grew up in the same county in Virginia, and both were from privileged families. Tyler was born in 1790, went to William and Mary College, and then, like so many other presidents, joined a law firm. After that, he had a pretty straight political rise. He served in the Virginia House of Delegates, then was a congressman, then governor of Virginia, and then a U.S. senator. Well, that whole time, Tyler was fairly strong-willed and stubborn, I guess you could say. He resigned from Congress because he thought the Missouri Compromise showed a use of too much federal power, and yet he also stopped being governor of Virginia because he thought he had too little power. Tyler had originally been a supporter of the Democratic Party, which was the party that Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren were part of. And that was largely because Tyler favored states' rights, limited government, and tended to side with slave-holding Southerners. But it turned out that Tyler was not ultimately a fan of Andrew Jackson, and so he eventually took up with the Whig party instead. In the 1840 election, Tyler ended up on the ticket as William Henry Harrison's vice president. Part of the reason that he was put on the ticket as vice president was that the Whigs thought that Tyler's somewhat divergent views on states' rights would actually help them attract more Southern voters. As we'll see in a bit, though, the fact that he held different views from the Whigs might have helped the Whigs win the White House, but it kind of came back to bite them when Tyler ended up being the actual president and not just the VP. I asked the wife of Harrison Tyler, the grandson we heard from earlier, to describe John Tyler for me. He was uh, six, two and a half. He had reddish brown hair. That's a picture of him up there on the wall. He did have a nose that was a slight beak, but it wasn't huge. It came out sort of had a little big, big, you know, little point in the top. And a number of our cousins have it. Mm -hmm. And I have a grandson who has it, and I'm so thrilled that he has it. I said, oh, Harrison, you've got the darling <laughs> nose. I'm so proud of you. That's wonderful. We were sitting in her sunroom overlooking the James River in Virginia, along with their son, William Tyler, who's John Tyler's great-grandson. People come to the door uh, occasionally, and they're blonde and they're short and they're square, and they say, I'm a direct descendant of John Tyler, and I think, no, you're not, <laughs> for you would be six feet two, and you'd have dark brown eyes, 
Admittedly, though, there are more Tyler descendants than anyone could reasonably keep track of. John Tyler had more children than any other president. He had 15, eight with his first wife, and then when his first wife died while he was president, he remarried and had seven more children with his next wife, Julia Gardner. Julia's family lived in New York and owned the largest private island in the entire United States, known as Gardner's Island, and the story goes that her family had bought it from the Montauk Indian tribe, who were willing to sell the island because they thought it was haunted. Anyway, Julia was 30 years younger than John Tyler, and she married him while he was still president in a secret ceremony in New York. One of their children was Lion Gardner Tyler, and John Tyler was 63 years old when that child was born. Well, that son Lion had two marriages and six kids himself, and one of those kids he had when he was 75 years old. That was Harrison Tyler. Whew, and that is how it's possible that Harrison Tyler, John Tyler's grandson, is still alive today. You know, back in those days, they didn't have birth control, so you got to burn out your first wife with a slew of babies and then get another well, one. Well, what a thing to say. <laughs> Good Lord, I can tell you related to your father. <laughs> and the same thing would come out of his mouth, my dear. <laughs> So let's take a look back at Tyler's transition from vice president to president. If you listened to last week's episode, you'll remember that President William Henry Harrison got sick and died after only a month in the White House. Well, nowadays we think, of course John Tyler, his vice president, would just automatically become president. But at that time, no other president had yet died in office, and so it actually wasn't entirely clear what should happen. It was very uncertain what would be the status of John Tyler. Many people thought that John Tyler would basically be an quote-unquote acting president, but it was Tyler who said, no, I'm going to be the president and take the oath. And um, it set a precedent for how succession would happen. Barbara Baer is a historian at the Library of Congress. We have a window into what's going through Tyler's mind as he takes over the presidency because he writes a letter to a colleague in the Senate after Harrison's death. My dear sir, the death of our late patriotic president, while it has devolved upon me the high office of the President of the United States, has occasioned me the deepest pain and anxiety. Apart from my apprehensions of my want of the necessary qualifications for the discharge of the important functions of chief magistrate, even under the most favorable circumstances, I am under providence made the instrument of a new test, which is for the first time to be applied to our institutions. The experiment is to be made at a moment when the country is agitating by conflicting views of public policy and when the spirit of faction is most likely to exist. Under these circumstances, the devolvement upon me of this high office is peculiarly embarrassing. In the administration of the government, I shall act upon the principles which I have all along espoused. It's quite an amazing letter about his own surprise. Everyone was surprised. No one had thought John Tyler would be president. To me, the key phrase is, I shall act upon the principles which I have all along espoused. Translated, that means that in spite of feeling unsteady about assuming the presidency, or maybe because he felt unsteady about it, John Tyler decided to stick to his own gut about what to do. And the result of that was that he didn't just carry out the policies that Harrison would have as president. Tyler decides to set his own agenda that's quite different. Tyler would surprise the Whigs that had put him into office by basically acting counter to many of the Whig platform principles. He was especially supposed to be against the overuse of executive power, but one of the first things he did was um, veto the bill to reestablish the Bank of the United States. The Bank of the United States has been a point of contention for just about the entire history of the United States up until this point. 
It was originally Alexander Hamilton's idea to have a national bank that would hold federal funds, but Thomas Jefferson and others considered that unconstitutional, and so the bank basically dissolved under President Madison. President Monroe brought it back, only to have Andrew Jackson more or less kill it again. So by the time Tyler is president, his party, the Whigs, put it at the top of their agenda to resurrect the Bank of the United States. But Tyler goes against his party and vetoes their own bill. This veto of the bank bill led to his cabinet resigning. And, you know, we had almost by September of the first year in office, you know, a kind of um, everything falling apart under Tyler. Not only do Tyler's cabinet members resign, but the Whigs in Congress officially kick him out of the party. And they even try, unsuccessfully, to start impeachment proceedings against him. Tyler's vetoes, of course, have angered them, but so has his leadership style. Some of them think he was wrong and aggressive in taking the official title of president, and others also get the sense that he doesn't care what leaders in his cabinet or his party think. You know, at the first cabinet meeting, apparently, the ca- Secretary of State Daniel Webster, sort of one of the you know, towering figures, basically said to Tyler, look, the way President Harrison operated was that we would take a vote, and then even if he was in the minority, he would follow the decision of the majority. And Tyler basically said to him, in essence, well, that's not the way I plan to do it. I'm going to be the president, and ultimately uh, the executive power uh, resides in me, and, and I plan to exercise it. That was Joel Goldstein, a professor at the St. Louis University School of Law, who's a scholar, a quite rare scholar, of the vice presidency. After Tyler is disowned by the Whigs, he's a president without a party. His term in office is marked by that bank fiasco, and then most notably by setting in motion the annexation of Texas. That is, Tyler creates the conditions for Texas to join the United States as a slave state in 1845. But if we're thinking about John Tyler's legacy and his enduring impact on the presidency itself, it's really his decision to take over as president, more so than the policies he did or didn't promote during his tenure, that really had a major lasting effect on the office. The idea that a vice president should automatically become the official new president if a president dies in office, well, that comes to be known as the Tyler precedent. And it's a precedent that comes to form the backbone of presidential succession policies from then on. So I thought it'd be interesting to take a little time now to explore vice presidential history and how it is that Tyler left an important mark on what we now today think of as the purpose of vice presidents. It's never been entirely clear why, they, what, why the founders created the vice presidency. Before the Tyler succession, there really were some unusual events with the vice presidency. I mean, for instance, in the first 50 years, three vice presidents were elected president, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Martin Van Buren. Since then, we've only had one vice president who's been a sitting vice president who's been elected. Two vice presidents had died in office. One vice president, John Calhoun, had resigned. Two vice presidents had served under two different presidents. One vice president, Daniel Tompkins, had sort of deteriorated because he drank too much. And um, another one, Richard Johnson, had spent a lot of his time as vice president running a tavern in Washington. Um, So it was a colorful time in some ways for the vice presidency before Tyler, even though they really had nothing significant to do in terms of official duties. As Barbara mentioned earlier, there was confusion when President William Henry Harrison died about what exactly should happen next. The reason that there was an issue is that the text of the Constitution in Article 2, Section 1, Clause 6, had an ambiguity as to whether it was the office that devolved on the vice president or whether it was the powers and duties that devolved on the vice president. Some people, including John Quincy Adams, thought that John Tyler shouldn't officially have the status and title of president. He should just carry out the president's duties, but basically officially remain vice president. 
maybe he could keep that up for the whole term, or maybe they'd have another election of sorts for a new president. Well, Tyler disagreed with all of those possibilities. He declared himself the actual president. He even did things like return letters unread if they were addressed to him as vice president or acting president. Eventually, through what seems like unwavering persistence, he gets the House and Senate to recognize his presidential status. After Tyler really creates the Tyler precedent that a vice president following a president's death is becomes president, doesn't simply act as president, um, and after Congress accepts that interpretation, the Tyler precedent is followed. And between um, 1841 and 1963, each time a president dies in office, the next seven times, each time the Tyler precedent is followed. And I think the fact that that was accepted and was accepted in an enduring way really added to the status of vice presidents as presidential successors. This Tyler precedent definitely helped eliminate confusion when future presidents would die in office, but it made things a bit tricky in the future cases where presidents didn't die, but they became sick or in some other way incapacitated. It raised the question, does the vice president seriously just become president in those cases too? When presidents became disabled, it created a problem. When President Garfield was shot and basically was disabled for 80 days before he died, really, um, he did nothing other than sign one paper during that period of time. He clearly was disabled, but the cabinet was afraid to call Vice President Arthur to act as president because they were concerned that once he began to discharge the presidency, that in effect, under the Tyler precedent, he would become president. Then in September of 1919, when Woodrow Wilson had a stroke that basically immobilized him for for much of of the remainder of his term, you had a similar situation where there was some concern that if the vice president acted, that it might supplant the president. It's not until 1967 that the issue is finally resolved. After more than a century of working unofficially off of the Tyler precedent, the 25th Amendment is passed, and it once and for all officially clarifies the terms of presidential succession. It basically says that if the president dies, resigns, or is removed from office, then the vice president becomes the new real president. But if the president is just temporarily disabled or incapacitated, then the vice president essentially takes over the duties of president for that period, but not the full role and title itself. All right, so you might think people would pay more attention to their vice presidential choice after Tyler. But if anything, I think you might argue that the opposite happens. Tyler was the 10th president, the 12th president, Zachary Taylor picks Millard Fillmore, who's not a very distinguished guy when he becomes president. Chester Arthur, who became president when President Garfield was assassinated, had The highest position he ever held was collector of customs in the Port of New York. Garrett Hobart, who was William McKinley's first vice president, had never held the position higher than being a member of the New Jersey state legislature. The fact that the vice president could become president and could even become president, as Tyler did, for almost the whole presidential term, in Tyler's case, three years and 11 months, didn't seem to make people stop and say, we really should take this seriously. So the vice presidency goes through a period of being particularly unglamorous. FDR's vice president, John Nance Garter, even makes the famous comment that the vice presidency isn't worth a bucket of warm spit. It really wasn't a very appealing job if you were ambitious or if you wanted to accomplish anything. When Theodore Roosevelt was thinking about whether or not he should be open to the vice presidency in 1900, he wrote letters back and forth with his friend Henry Cabot Lodge and said, in essence, you know, I really would prefer to be something that would give me more um, of an active role, like being the governor of the Philippines. 
we still poke fun a bit today at the vice presidency, but few people would make that comment Teddy Roosevelt made today. And that's largely because there was a tipping point for VPs in the late 20th century. If Tyler's the one who left the biggest mark on the role of vice president in the 19th century, it's Walter Mondale, Jimmy Carter's vice president, who does so in the 20th century. The Mondale vice presidency recreated the vice presidency, moved it into the White House, made it an integral part of presidential and White House decision making, made it a high level troubleshooter for the president. And I think that's really the role that Mondale and his five successors have each filled. And I think it has really represented one of the great success stories in American constitutional development. Here we have this office that for most of our history was something of a laughing stock. You know, it was disparaged, was not worth a picture of whatever John Nance Garner said it wasn't worth. And then from 1977 on, it really becomes a very robust and significant um, office. Would you advise someone today who has presidential ambitions to take the role of vice president if offered? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it, so I think for most people, it helps you towards a presidential run. There's the rare exception, somebody like a Robert Kennedy or a Hillary Clinton who has such independent stature that they may not need to be vice president to get what it offers. But I think the other reason really to be vice president now, if you have confidence in the president, is that it's a chance for high level um, contribution and involvement that you can't get anywhere else pretty much other than being president. I mean, Vice presidents are in the Oval Office, they're in the Situation Room, they're in high-level decision-making, they're meeting with foreign leaders, they're dealing with congressional leaders more than any other American figures are. John Tyler thinks about running for re-election when his term is up. He's certainly not running as a Whig, so he actually tries to get the Democratic Party nomination. But he doesn't, so he briefly runs as a third-party candidate and quickly realizes that's not going to work out, so he withdraws and just throws his support behind Democratic candidate James K. Polk. When Tyler leaves office, he doesn't have a lot of fans. In fact, on the very last day of his term, the Congress finally overrides one of his presidential vetoes. And that's the first time this ever happened in American history. Tyler leaves Washington and goes back to his home in Charles City, Virginia, which is where I went to visit. He's known as the uh, outlaw president, or uh, uh, his accidency was his name, but... So when he comes back, the plantation, which was known as Walnut Grove, uh, or Creek Plantation prior to that, was renamed by the president. Uh, Henry Clay may have given a speech on uh, um, the president's leaving office, and in that speech he said, we're well rid of that old outlaw. He can return, like Robin Hood, to his Sherwood Forest. So the president names the plantation Sherwood Forest. He has his door knocker made in New York in 1845, inscribed with the word Sherwood Forest and hung on the door. That was Tim Coyne. He gives tours and maintains the home, which is built in this really interesting style where it's only one room deep, but it runs the length of a football field. The house has stayed in the Tyler family ever since John Tyler purchased it, and it's chock full of this eclectic mix of presidential, historical furniture, and then just present-day toys and riding boots and framed photographs of current family members. This house is is lived in. This uh, uh, wouldn't be considered strictly a museum at this point. It is, uh, uh, it has been residential ever since the uh, president lived here with his wife, Julia. And it's haunted. 
the gray lady uh, supposedly was uh, taking care of an infant who uh, she had later lost because he had a communi had that communicable disease. And if you look up the stairwell here, let me turn this light off, underneath the banister <laughs> on the back wall, what do you see there? Besides, down below, real low. A face. That's right. You see a face. I scared you. <laughs> it really does look like a face. I took a photo of it so I can share it with all of you on our Instagram account, but honestly, I cannot wait to post it because I really want to just delete it off my phone. It's creeping me out. That's our gray lady, and uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, it gets brighter every year. And That has been painted over a few times and um, had some plaster repair, and it just comes right just back through. Just reappears. Through. Yeah. <laughs> Is the ghost real? I have no idea, but... As I've worked on this podcast, I have been getting a more and more vivid sense of what it would be like to live in these United States during the country's young years of the 1800s. There's death and violence all around, and some of it is very visible and aggressive, like duels and lynchings and slavery and Native American removal. And some of it is very quiet and mysterious. It's children and its presidents and first ladies who are dying of these causes that no one at the time understands. And all of this just adds to the tragedy and fear and superstition and strange magic of the time that we still get a peek at when we hear stories like this of a president's home haunted by a ghost. I asked Mrs. Tyler about the Grey Lady and she swears it's true. The first night that I spent at Sherwood Forest, we were still constructing, reconstructing the house. And I was alone. And I was on the second floor in the master bedroom on a little cot on the floor. And someone walked across the hall, opened the door, went across the room to the corner. There's nothing in the corner. Fiddled around in the corner a great deal. Turned around, came back. Fortunately, she didn't care that I was there. And walked out. I was terrified. Terrified. I was afraid to open my eyes because there might have been eyes looking at me. And that would not have been good. So I waited until just I could get up and still see. And in my night clothes, I walked across our garden, across a field, across a ditch with water in it, and into the house of Gardener Tyler, knocking on his door at about five in the morning. And Gardener said, Oh, I know why you're here. You've seen the gray lady. And I said, the what? And he told me, he said, oh, someone should have told you about her before. Uh, it shouldn't have been just popped on you like that. And so he brought me down and gave me a drink of whiskey, <laughs> which made me feel better. The White House is rumored to be haunted as well, most notably by Abraham Lincoln, but also by his son Willie, who died in the White House. At the time of their son's death, there is even some evidence that Mary Todd Lincoln held seances at the White House to try to contact him. There was a spiritualism in 19th century America that we glimpse in these presidential stories in its own way, it captures some small sense of the type of tragedy and uncertainty of our country at that time. Anyway, while we're speaking of Lincoln, in 1861, the year before Tyler died, Tyler led the Richmond Peace Convention, which was this effort to find some compromise to keep the North and South together as the divide over slavery became stronger and stronger. Tyler met with Lincoln in Washington, D.C. shortly before Lincoln took office, and he tells him about the recommendations that came out of this convention. 
while Lincoln decides not to pursue any of Tyler's plan. After that, Tyler essentially stops trying to bridge a compromise and decides to, well, side with the Southerners, but also play something of a leadership role among the Southerners who want to secede from the Union. When the South decides to put together its own House of Representatives, the Confederate House of Representatives, John Tyler is elected to hold a seat. But then he dies in January of 1862, just a few days before he's supposed to take it. Many thanks to this week's guests, Barbara Baer of the Library of Congress and Joel Goldstein of St. Louis University. And of course, very many thanks to the Tyler family, Harrison Tyler, his wife Frances Tyler, and their son William Tyler. Thanks as well to Tim Coyne and Anik Denning who work at Sherwood Forest. Music for the podcast is by Dave Wessner and production help for this episode is by Diana Douglas. Next week we'll be talking about James K. Polk. And for the many of you who've asked if we're going to play the song that bears his name, yes. Yes, we will. (laughs) Thanks for listening. Oh, and there's one little parting factoid I'll leave you with. It was during the last few months of John Tyler's presidency that the U.S. finally established a national election day and decided that all the states would vote on that same day the first Tuesday of November. I'll catch you again next week.